Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Chris Lydon, who is in India and uh, one of the first to start podcasts, if not the first. We say the first. We say the first. With another guy who is doing the thinking, you know. You know, what is different in the US and here? Do you think it's because that in some sense the alternate voices in the US tend to be like uh, the real news. Democracy now, yeah. Democracy now, the real news. All of this tend to be just video while you have just text, the kind of platforms we talked about, which are just text. But you don't get a mix of these two. Is that what you think is the difference? It's very complicated. I, I, I think it's, um, I mean, the New York Times, for example, is doing a lot of mixed media now and multimedia, television, I mean, video, and, and they have blogs and uh, podcasts too. But I, the alternate side, do you think they're missing that in the US? I think it's a question of, um, independence and the New York Times is such an institution by now and I worked for the New York Times for covered presidential politics uh, Jimmy Carter Ronald Reagan that whole period in the 70s into the 80s um, um, they it's hard to describe their interest but they have one and it's I suppose it, it comes down basically to being the most respected voice they had no voice at all in, in electing Donald Trump. I think that's their main, there are many reasons to, to be angry about but Donald Trump. But it's difficult to understand why they become the voice of war, which is what they're rooting for right now. Uh, that's a tricky one. They're married to the Cold War, for sure. Um, they also, uh, they have a particular uh, interest in Israel, I would say. Um, they have a particular interest in, uh, in Wall Street, the center of American investment. They come out of the Rockefeller world, uh, which is very worldwide, global, uh, oil, petrochemical industries. Um, and uh, they managed to point the finger at everybody else. Um, they, they want to remain the center. They got caught way off balance in the Trump era. Uh, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump came out of New York. They were New York political figures. Turned out they didn't had no idea where Trump was coming from. They didn't know him. They, 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 but in any event, um, I, I, to me, the interesting thing, it's hard to put your finger on precisely, is but there is a test going on here of uh, the American empire after a fashion in a kind of crisis. We have, we have been so far astray from our own ideals since Vietnam, uh, and that burden is so hard to talk about, but two million Vietnamese peasants killed by American weapons and, and soldiers is, is a horrible record. Um, I think of 50 years since I've been out of college, um, it's been a deeply inglorious time, not only wins and losses, but for um, the, the moral implications of, of these wars, and now a kind of permanent war around the Middle East. Um, how did I get to that? The New York Times is stuck with this imperial voice. It sticks itself with this imperial place, um, and we've almost entirely blotted out um, popular conversation. Tony Judd, an American writer who died maybe 10 years ago, wrote a marvelous last book. He was dying as he, as he spoke it, um, Ill Fare is the Land. But he said the great majority of the American people are not part of any important conversation, and they know it. Um, we have to restore a popular American tone to our media. I love to do it. I mean, I, I'm convinced <laughs> that the, the human voice does it best, does it better even than writing, does it better than video. Video is so distracting. When, when, when you're looking at a football game, our football, people are crashing into each other all over the place, it's impossible to ca carry on a conversation. But take the pictures away, focus the conversation in human voices, and we're very, very sensitive to the implications of the human voice. Um, I think that's the way to get it, so get it you back. think podcast therefore restores the balance in some sense between not distracting the mind too much with the images exactly. and yet brings exactly. the emotional content yeah. into what you are going to, you are saying yeah. unlike the dispassionate printed word as it were well, you exactly. said this is the this is the sweet spot for at least the serious thinking is that what you would say well no you say it very well and we haven't rehearsed this i mean you say a sweet spot the voice is so 
laden with feeling. I know from your voice roughly how old you are, male, female, maybe Indian, maybe Italian accent in, in the United States, um, and it registers emotion. It, it communicates something of feeling uh, that doesn't come through almost any other way. And when you think about it, uh, back to you know primitive man um, in the plains of East Africa, you had to be listening all the time. Danger, help, uh, friendship, love, it's all conveyed through the ear. Um, Studs Terkel, who was a great radio genius in the city of Chicago for many, many years, uh, he called it that fabulous instrument, vox humana, the human voice. It's, it, it, it's so trustworthy. I sort of know a phony when I hear the voice. I know a worried person. I know a learned person. Uh, you don't have to see the person. Oftentimes, we think it's distracting to see them. You start noticing his hair or his, you know, his missing teeth or his big ears or, or whatever it is or hers. Um, radio is a, an almost indestructible medium, I think, for, first of all, radios are cheap. Anybody can do it. And now the podcast and the internet is virtually anybody with a, with a laptop. Now, this, a, is, the other, to this is the other part that it democratizes communications also in a way because you don't require a lot of equipment. Right. It's very light, so the data charges for poorer people are much less yeah. compared to what it would be if you had to show video. And I do realize that in News Click, probably we're missing the fact that we haven't started podcast. And this discussion hmm. is very good for me because I think that's something that we are going to move in very quickly. But you know, the last point I would like to raise with you, mm. you talked about the God giving us internet, of course, as a joke, but internet had the promise that it will democratize education. Mm. But with the platforms emerging, the Google, what we call the digital monopolies, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, yep. they're also capturing the net in a way. Yeah, this is... It's an enclosure movement, if you will, that it is trying to enclose our voices and make them heard only through them. Mm. And now you have the algorithms, which they will decide what goes through and what is fake news. Right. So just as you may have right-wing uh, info wars being taken off or being considered mm. fake news, your voice and my voice tomorrow is also in the category of fake news according to, shall we say, the test of New York Times, because that's the kind of test they're willing to talk about, that we'll get certain, say, 12, 15 respected voices with which we'll test what is news or not news, which means you have, shall we say, a different kind of censorship which will come in through the algorithms, and that will yeah, be yeah, even yeah. more difficult to fight because you can't fight it legally. Yeah, we haven't figured this out yet. And we've gone, in the States, I would say, We've gone in 15 years from a kind of insane, ecstatic utopia, a digital utopia, um, to uh, a, a real awareness that this is much more complicated than that. First of all, as you say, incredibly concentrated. Uh, people have, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg has, he's gonna be worth $200 billion any day now. And, and of course they're controlling it, and of course they're f forming groups and excluding others uh, that maximize the advertising value, all of the, these nightmares. It's, and, 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 and particularly, you know, they don't pay much taxes on what they're gathering either. Amazon is basically destroying retail America. Um, it's now in India as well. Yeah, and, and we didn't see these things coming, and it's going to have to be fine-tuned. Europe seems to be more aggressive about regulating these new monopolies, and, and, and maybe the monopolies simply have to be grow, uh, broken up. I mean, the United States has a record for breaking up monopolies. Phone monopoly, IBM, uh, there, were, there were, even in those uh, bad old days, good old days, um, we understand that monopoly is bad, and it may have to be undone. Um, but uh, w when you have easy access, inexpensive access for any voice, popular voices, uh, the changes will be made, I think. That, I mean, I, I'm still optimistic about the possibility. You know, literally, it's 50 years ago, there was a, there was a Catholic priest, Pierre Théard de Chardin. I don't know if you've heard that name. He was a paleontologist, but he wrote a book in which he predicted everything we're going through, a kind of electronic uh, unity of the world, something like the, uh, I always think, something like the, you know, there's a market in yen, or dollars, or pound that runs 
around the world, 24 hours seven, uh, ever. It's, it's just going, it's a kind of a conversation about what's your yen worth, what's my dollar worth, or whatever. Um, and he foresaw the day when we would have a, a really, a, he called it the noosphere. Noos being the Greek word for mind. We would have a mind sphere running continually around the world of conversation, discovery, literature, science, you name it. Um, and we're almost there now. And he said it was a, his intuition was that it was one of the historic steps in the evolution of the human species. And he's speaking as a Catholic priest. I mean, he, he's speaking of the old orthodoxy, but he saw it coming. Uh, it's still early. We don't know how to, quite yet, how to do it to keep it open, make it extend the human capacity rather than diminish it, uh, make peace as well as you know, hostility. But let me toss it back to you in a, in a different way. Um, we believe in voice, we believe in human equality, we believe in, in including everybody in, in theory. Um, I keep trying to think, and I don't know enough about India, Pakistan, but can you imagine that a whole variety of conversations, people at home, people on the street, people at work, um, venting on uh, these issues, going back to partition, going back to self-rule, um, could open up a conversation in which there are embedded interests, there's a lot of history there, commercial interests, military interests, political interests. Can you imagine um, a, an amateur conversation through podcasting that would sort of uh, help, help open it up? I think in the United States, I mean, uh, the question would be, could we, is there, a, is there a way to address our racial differences, differences of, of income, wealth, history, privilege, the slavery history, which is very much alive again in American people's minds, could podcasting, by which I mean a kind of everybody conversation, when you want to, when you want to add something. Uh, but in India's situation, can you imagine podcasting, podcast being a help? You know, this is the fundamental promise of what the internet used to be. Yeah, yeah. That you will have multicasting, we'll be able to talk to each other, what tends to happen that you amplify what you want, you what you already want to right. believe. And you talk to the people you, that you agree with. So right. what it does, it seems to amplify what could be called, or what are being called, filter bubbles. That you talk to line, like-minded, mm -hmm. and instead of a public discourse, what you get is a kind of strong uh, centers forming, which don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And therefore, instead of having a discussion across these mm -hmm. bubbles, mm -hmm. you tend to then concentrate opinion even more. So you get heterogeneity, but the heterogeneity is really of strong homogeneous groups. So conversation mm -hmm. across groups seems to in fact diminish in, in the internet space. Because when you're face to face with each other, you don't normally abuse each other. You try to be civil. There is a mm -hmm. human response by which if you don't see somebody, you can actually be much more vitriolic. So what I'm tending yeah, to yeah, see yeah, is, interesting. is this, this fractures of our public discourse into strong, uh, shall we say, drift away from each other. So I'm not sure that mm. by technology overcome that. Mm. So it's like mobilization and counter mobilization of the real world also tend to happen in this world as well. So I think technology has to be married to movements on the ground mm. to be able to transcend these so-called bubbles that are forming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think alone technology is ever going to be a solution. Yes, it has always mm -hmm. potential for both amplification mm -hmm. as well as destruction and amplification could lead to the peace being amplified, mm -hmm. uh, better uh, you know, struggles for humanity to be amplified, but it is also the mm. possibility of hatred being amplified. Don't forget, mass media, mm. fascist Italy. It was Mussolini who used radio. Yeah, and yeah, don't yeah. forget the famous uh, films that came out of uh, uh, Germany. And the United States. Nuremberg. Birth of a Nation, of course. On the other hand, I mean, Will we, to victory, what was it? the famous fascist Nazi film, yeah. which, which came out, which shows on Nuremberg that huge stage, Hitler standing, 
those are all actually mm. Lady Reifenstahl, the, basically the construction mm. of the fascist mm. image, which is what a lot of people then said, mass media is dangerous to democracy. So you know, what I'm saying is I'm not going to take that position. I'm saying that both potentials exist and how we do it. But, That's but issue. podcasting, thank God, is not mass media. And I think there are, there are people who feel it cannot be monopolized or controlled the way the way Facebook, for example, sort of took over blogging. It, you know, instead of writing your blog, you, oh, you put, and then it, 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 we haven't even spoken of the trivialization of the conversation. I mean, when you're putting pictures of your cats and your dogs and uh, your babies, uh, that's another way it goes wrong. But I like the notion, I don't really understand it, that the human voice and the live and spontaneous open quality of it makes it very, very hard to control or to buy. Um, I think podcasters, and I think you and I are uh, like this, we're, we're not in it oddly enough to make money we're, we're yeah, but or, you know, or get elected. Chris, uh, Chris, uh, let's, Chris, let's sort of get this part right. That internet is an individual experience, but mm -hmm. it's a mass media. The fact that if 70,000 people can listen to the podcast individually, mm -hmm. it still is mass media, just as the videos on YouTube are consumed individually, but they're really used, they are really a mass platform. Mm -hmm. Yes, the centralization doesn't take place because it's a equivalent to a website, so mm -hmm. that if you have net neutrality, which in the US is not there anymore, you would then get into the position that some of the sites will be completely frozen out. Mm -hmm. India, we still accept net neutrality, I think so does your large parts of Europe. So all websites have equal access, mm -hmm. okay? So access is a, it cannot be monopolized, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, it is still, though individually consumed, all of these are really, to me, mass media. Yes, it's mm -hmm. not being synchronous so that if Mussolini speaks, the whole nation listens. That mm -hmm. may not happen, but the fact that you, you have, you're reaching 50,000, 100,000 people, if you do through a podcast, it still makes it mass media. Can I ask you two questions, and, and these are technical, and, and you're much more adept technically than I. How can you build a podcast that lets listeners respond in their voices? And the second question is, how do you assemble a variety of podcasts that are not all being edited by the same person, that retain individuality, but can sort of promote each other, be friendly together, represent, build build a complex a, a complex audience uh, that's bigger than you know all the individual voices put together. So the second is an easier one to answer because mm -hmm. essentially what it means is create a website which have multiple people can have their own podcasts in it, give them the tools to do it mm -hmm. so that they they can podcast whenever they want and that could then be put, put to, they could publish it very easily. So I think that's a relatively a simple issue to solve. For example, I'm thinking of how do we have a science um, channel, in effect, on a, on a podcast, and also a, a, a book uh, channel, also a musical channel, also maybe I don't know. Um, so there are two uh, approaches to it, Chris. You could uh, call it a portal and each one could be accessed through a common, sh shall we say, interface. Mm -hmm. And you go to essentially individual sites. Or you could have it, they go to individual subspaces, but the navigation of all the spaces are relatively simple, simple or similar, mm -hmm. so that people don't have to discover each of the idiosyncrasies of each of the pages separately. Mm -hmm. So that's a technically a relatively simple task. The question that you asked, how do you have feedback, exactly. live, live podcast? And that I'll have to think over. But I think, yes, you could, you could announce that this time there's going to be a live podcast and that you could tune in, you can listen, like we have live Facebook Live. You can have YouTube Live. It is possible to do live from any website as well. So I think that's also a solvable problem. But how people access you back through voice easily? Do you give them a sort of telephone interface where they can ring in and you play the voices in real time? Those are the technical questions we have to answer. But I think these are very interesting questions and I think for me, the takeaway from this discussion is, how do you do it? And I would really love to partner you in doing it together. So we solve Let's both our problems. Let's do it. Let's do it. I found so, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think of Abhinandan, but also um, 
uh, Siddharth Bharadarajan, Bharadarajan, whom I knew somewhat in the States, briefly, and uh, such an impressive man at, at The Wire, but also Scroll, also the BBC's work. Um, India has, has, has something going here in putting really uh, sound, interesting, open, uh, not universal expert, but, but informed, uh, impassioned voices on the air for everybody to get in on. And I, I, I want to I go there with you. And I hope you have good opinion about News Click as well. I'm just joking. <laughs> and News Click. Thank you. It's good to be at News Click. Good to be on News Click. <laughs> thank you, Chris, for being with us. Thank this you. Has been I, this has been an incredibly uh, exciting week for me. And I'm going to be back, <laughs> whether you want me or not. <laughs> thank you very thanks much. Thank this you. is all the time we have today. Do tune into News Click. Do watch us on our website as well as on the YouTube channel. Listen to the audio portion too. And listen to the audio in future after this discussion. We'll have to come with the podcasts as well. Thank you.